So in my last video on the Native Americans and how they came across horses, I mentioned a lot of different tribes. Tribes like the Lakota, the Sioux, the Comanche, the Blackfoot. And so I thought for the next video in this series on the Native Americans and specifically the Plains tribes, I thought it would be an interesting one to look at where some of these names came from because the etymologies of the Native American tribe names are actually very interesting and there's lots of different languages that come into play here. So first of all, I wanted to take a look at the origin of Comanche, the tribe of the Comanche. Now the Comanche are very interesting people. They're often called the Lords of the Southern Plains and they basically had what some have described as an empire. Obviously, it's a bit of a loose term for such a nomadic tribe but they were most famous for living in the area of the Texas Panhandle and they had a huge range where they would uh, raid right down south into Mexico and into other states as well but mostly famous for their activity in Texas and the first time we hear about the Comanche from European sources is in 1705 in a mission in somewhere in New Mexico when the the Ute word Kimantse is used and this word in the Ute language means enemies because it was a party of Utes and Comanche that went down to the Spanish governor and that's how we, we get the transliteration coming from them. They were probably going down to trade horses. By 1705, the Comanche probably already had horses, as I mentioned in my video on that. But the Utes and the Comanche were traditionally enemies of each other. They were always fighting. And so the Ute word for Comanche was just the same as their word for enemy. And so the Spanish heard this in the transliteration when they uh, wrote this down because obviously these peoples didn't have any writing systems of their own, was that Kimanse became Comanche because it's easier, it's more of a Spanish sound for them to say. While the Comanche, on the other hand, referred to themselves as Nermenu. And all of the phonology in this for the Native American languages, I don't speak any Native American languages myself and it's quite hard to find online. So if there are any speakers of any of these languages, please let me know how it's pronounced correctly below, but I'm just going to do my best with what I've got. And this word Nermenu just means people. And this is a, a term we'll see a lot that the name for Native American tribes by them is just the people or the original dudes basically. So next I want to take a look at the Kiowa who for a long time took part in the same raids and went on the same hunts and often camped at the same sites as the Comanche even though their cultures were really quite different. They're very interesting. They for a, a while it's thought that they lived in the Rocky Mountains and then during the 17th and 18th centuries they migrated to the area of Colorado today but then in the 19th century they moved onto the plains and became a proper plains tribe. So a similar story to the Comanche who didn't originate on the plains as well. There was an awful lot of movement. So their term for themselves is the Ka Igua. And what we think this means is that the principal people or the first people, so it makes sense, but we don't think that's where the term Kiowa in English comes from. We think that might have come from another uh, plains tribe, the Arapaho. Now, the reason behind this is that the Arapaho also didn't originate on the plains, but they, at the same time as the Kiowa were living in Colorado, were also in that region. So we think that perhaps then the name Kiowa, because their name for the Kiowa was the Kouwa. And if you say that quite slowly, then it might sound a little bit like Kiowa. And what that means is creek. So it's possible that there was a, a story that maybe the Kiowa had been camping next to a, a stream or a river when the Arapaho first encountered them and that's why they became known as the Creek people or maybe there was some kind of tradition or ceremony or something like that. Unfortunately, I'm, I'm not too sure. But then Kiowa may be the European transliteration of this word from the Arapaho language, which means Creek and is used to refer to the people of the Creek. All right, let's next take a look at the Arapaho then. That would make sense. So the Arapaho were also more on the, on the Southern and Central Great Plains and they interacted with the Kiowa and the Comanche at various times as well, um, as well as another group, which I'll come on to in just a second. Now their name, it's possible that it comes from this amazing Pawnee word, which is, and I'm going to do my best here, eri ra ra puha. And what this means in the Pawnee language is trader or merchant. And we can probably see the context of this because the Arapaho then is a French transliteration of this rather long word. So you can imagine a Frenchman hearing it, they would go, ah, Arapaho, or something like this, if they heard this, this Pawnee word. And probably the reason for this would be that the Pawnee, they lived more in the kind of Missouri area, Kansas. So they lived much further east than they did um, later on because they were well driven on to the plains and they had weapons and things like this trading with the French for example um, and also 
driven by other tribes. And so when they interacted with the Arapaho, perhaps they were uh, interacting with them and, and selling weapons and, and maybe horses because the Arapaho probably had access to horses before the poor needed. So it's possible that th that's why they became known as traders. And then when the French came and interacted with the Pawnee, they then remembered the Arapaho as traders as well. And that's how the word came. But interestingly, lots of other tribes like the Pawnee, the Caddo, the Ute, the Comanche and the Wichita, so groups that are in Kansas, in Texas, this kind of area, um, they remember them as being dog eaters. So uh, yeah, that's an interesting one that they all have this name. So maybe that was a practice that was special to that tribe and none others. Um, the Arapaho themselves, they referred to them as Hinone Eno. And, and this means our people. So again, it's uh, referring to just the people, their people, which makes sense. So the other group I mentioned was the Cheyenne, and they often were uh, camping together and fighting together and hunting together with the Arapaho. They seem to have had a close connection between these two tribes. And they're a very interesting tribe as well. They live more to the north in many ways. There are now two bands of the Cheyenne. There's the Northern Cheyenne and the Southern Cheyenne. But at one point they were one band and they traveled around the plains. They were a very powerful force on the plains. Did you know that one of the main ways they did this was by using Skillshare to better compete and learn new skills on other tribes? Yeah, that, that's not actually true. But luckily, you can use Skillshare today to make this period of quarantine a bit more productive. And that's what I've been doing the last few days, so I would just like to mention thank you to Skillshare for sponsoring this video, and I would highly recommend going over to Skillshare and checking out what they have to offer. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of different classes for creative and for just generally curious people that you can learn new skills and develop new interests and just really hone in on your creativity and learn how to do things. There's a range of courses on a lot of different topics, so you can go from something like filmmaking and photography right through to drawing and the other arts, but Personally, I've been looking at some of the more um, productivity oriented ones because I have a lot of things going on at the same time. So I've really been enjoying this one by Mike Vardy on productivity habits that stick and actually getting into some useful habits and using that. I found that very useful, especially in quarantine because we have so much free time, but a lot of the time it's also difficult to know what to actually do with that time. But I think he, he has a really good approach in, in looking at how to do that. So I'd recommend going over and checking that out. There is also a special offer for people on the channel and I would recommend going to the description box because if you go there there's a link and if you follow that link then you can get two free months of premium membership for the first thousand people who click on that link and after that it's only ten dollars a month and there's lots of different courses on there so I think it would be really worth your while and thank you to Skillshare for sponsoring this video so back onto the Cheyenne and where their name comes from. And this term probably comes from the Sioux language. So again, from a different tribe, which is very interesting because it's hardly ever the group in question naming themselves. It's always all, all the examples so far have been other tribes names for them. And then that that name has stuck. So it's not actually you don't get to decide how how your tribe is known. But it's probably from this uh, Sioux word, um, which is something like uh, Cheyenne. Um, and this word meant, well, little Shaia, and Shaia is the, the term for red talker. So it's the, the little red talkers. And what they, what they mean by this are people who speak Algonquian languages. And this was one of the biggest language groups of Native Americans that, that were spoken. And they were spoken uh, across huge areas. So on the East Coast, a lot of them, as well as several places throughout the plains around the Great Lakes and further south. These are just a few of the main areas. You know, they're sprinkled throughout the United States, which is a, a fascinating study if you're trying to find out about migration and how the different groups moved before and after European uh, Contact. It's really amazing that they are so widespread throughout the Americas. Um, but there's also a term in the, the Suian language which is white talker, and this is the term that they would use for those who spoke a Suian language. So the distinction in the, the color of the talker that's, uh, that's speaking, obviously they don't mean um, white and red as in uh, Europeans and Native Americans. They're, they're all Native Americans here. But it's an interesting one that they have you know, their own language. They're the white talkers and the people who speak a foreign language are speaking red. They're speaking funny. Who knows what the actual etymology of that is? Okay, Okay, so na let's now take a look at Sioux, seeing as though we've talked about them already. Now, the Sioux are interesting. Um, they obviously are perhaps the most famous Native American tribe, or one of them. They're you know, known as the, the Laws of the Northern Plains. Very powerful tribe and put up a, a long fight against the, the U.S. Army. Now, the term probably comes from uh, an Ojibwe term, and th these peoples originally lived around the Great Lakes, but remember that the Sioux at the time, um, in the, the 17th century and 18th century, and even up until the mid-19th sort of century, there were groups that lived way 
further east, so in contact, and they were enemies of the Ojibwe for a long time. And the term is Nadoe Su, and what this means is the, the little snakes. Now what's interesting is that there's also a term for the Iroquois, which are also a, a huge confederation that lived on the, uh, the eastern seaboard around the Great Lakes, that area. Um, and their term, the Ojibwe term for the Iroquois, was the Nadoe. And that meant big snakes. So you had the, the little snakes, who were the, the Sioux living, who, that went to live on the plains, and the big snakes, who were the Iroquois. Possibly because the big snakes were, were very powerful and had there were many tribes. And had lots of people in the tribe and a lot of power, while the, the Sioux may have been a little smaller. Or there might be a completely other reason behind it. Now, the reason there is an X, it does make the, the name look pretty cool, is because that's the, the French transliteration. So, the French had a, had a lot of contact with the Ojibwe, of course, the area of the Great Lakes. There was a lot of trade, especially the fur trade, the beaver trade, um, and beaver pelts. And the French were very involved in that for a long time. And that's why Nadoué Sioux, uh, with the, the X for the plural there, as, as the French do, that's why the Sioux now has a has an x on the end because of that there's also the term uh, lakota which is used a lot of the time i think they prefer to use that term for themselves a lot of the time as well as dakota obviously that's now given the name to two states north and south dakota there's also a third term which is nakota which but i think it's less used but these are different branches different groups and and basically the what what they denote is is friend or ally so we can sort of see a, a, a structure of the tribe with these different groups i think it, the the correct term to refer to them would be as different groups belonging to the same tribe because then you have bands of those as well like the um, Oglala Lakota or the Hunkpapa uh, Lakota would be uh, would be bands of the tribes the hierarchy is a little bit complex and it's not as as a sort of um, it, it's quite fluid from what I what I understand that the band the tribe and the group kind of dynamic but very interesting nonetheless all right so now I want to take a look at a group that lived more to the west and these I think in America, you call them the Nez Perce, mostly. They're a very interesting group. So the Appaloosa horse, which you can see in the background, was, was sort of famously their horse that they rode a lot of these horses, the spotted horses there. Now, their name is actually directly from French. And in French, it's Nez Perce. And what this means is the pierced nose. And so that's quite interesting. So we can imagine that potentially among that tribe, there was a particular custom of, of piercing the nose or perhaps that it wasn't actually that particular to them at all, but rather that the French just associated that with them, that perhaps they'd been in contact with a trader or that, again, they'd had uh, contact with another tribe who said, oh yeah, they're really weird, they, they put stuff in their nose. I don't know, but it's interesting to speculate. The Ne Perse, on the other hand, they refer to themselves as the Ne Peu. And again, that means the people, um, as in other cases. So, the Blackfoot, where it all started, what about their name? Well, that's kind of a complex one because you also have Blackfoot and Blackfeet and where these traditions come from. It's one of the tribes that I visited when I was in America and have some books on. So I think I might make a separate video on that just to look specifically at them and call it a day here with all of these because there's been quite a few. But anyway, thank you very much for watching. I hope it's been somewhat interesting to learn about the etymologies of some of these uh, tribes and their names. I certainly think it's pretty interesting and especially how uh, a lot of them come from different tribes and how they viewed uh, these tribes and, and what they did and their customs rather than the tribes themselves naming, uh, you know, passing down the name that they would become known as by Europeans in the future. If you did enjoy it, please let me know, sort of leave a comment in the comments below. I'm sure there'll be a mad discussion as always. Uh, and give me a thumbs up to let me know if you want to see more of this kind of content. I'll have a podcast out on Wednesday again and then another kind of normal video like this on Saturday. I think that's how I'm going to structure it. And um, yeah, thank you very much for watching. Check out uh, Skillshare as well. That'll be really great. Anyway, I've been Hilbert and this has been The History.